try to give me as much head up as you can as the wind. Store near the exit, but that could jam. Okay. But it's the traffic on Barbie. All right, appreciate it. It really messes up getting out of there. there. Um, <laughs> it's interesting that this stage, they haven't done that. Hmm? No. no, not to my knowledge. So but I say, I, I, I can't participate. I couldn't participate in that one anyhow. So, so I'm, risky. Uh -huh. I'm in the notification zone. So. We shall see. I mean, I appreciate having the gas station there because that's where my wife and I generally buy gas. But I know there are a lot of people that don't like it. So. Same started, same ending. Good evening. Welcome to the Durham Planning Commission. Uh, the commission, the members of the commission have been appointed by the city council and the county board of commissioners as an advisory board to the elected officials. So you should know that the elected officials have the final say in any issue that's before us this evening. If you wish to speak on an agenda item this evening, you can sign up to the table on my left on your right. And each side will get 10 minutes to speak for and against each item on the agenda. And the time will be divided by each of the members who are signed up to speak. Uh, finally, all motions are stated in the affirmative. So if a motion fails or ties, the recommendation is for denial. May we have the roll call, please? Commissioner Alturk. Present. Commissioner Johnson. Present. Commissioner Baker. Present. Commissioner Brine. Present. Commissioner Satterfield. Here. Commissioner Durkin. Here. Commissioner Hyman. Present. Uh, Chair Busby. Here. Commissioner Miller. Here. Commissioner Ketchin is currently absent. Commissioner Hornbuckle. Present. Commissioner Gibbs. Present. And Commissioner Williams is excused. Great. Thank you. We will move to the approval of the minutes and the consistency statement from our October 9th, 2018 meeting. Do we need a motion for Commissioner Williams? Ah, yes, we do. Thank you very much. I move the excused absence for Commissioner Williams. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. Thank you, Commissioner Bryan. We'll move to the approval of the minutes and the consistency statement. I know we had one correction, Commissioner Hyman, Vice Chair Hyman. Yes, um, Mr. Hornbuckle had asked for an excused absence, and I wanted to make a motion that we do this at this time retroactively from the last meeting, if that's uh, appropriate. I'll second the motion. It properly moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Any adjustments to the agenda? No, that was just the excused absence. You haven't done the minutes yet. We haven't Still done waiting the for George yet. to tell us whether they were all right. <laughs> well, I'll, well, um, move, I'll we? move approval of the minutes and consistency statements from the October meeting. Second. Second. Okay. So moved by Commissioner Bryan, seconded by, we'll say Commissioner Miller, because I heard him the fastest, I guess. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Adjustments to the agenda? Good evening, Commissioners. Ms. Sarah Young with the Planning Department, filling in for Gray Smith tonight, who is out um, unexpectedly ill. So first thing as an adjustment is that you have at your seats your 2019 proposed meeting calendar that you will need to approve this evening. Um, I suggest that we add that as an item under new business. Uh, in addition, uh, we have, as pro I think I promised, I don't know how many meetings back now, we were gonna start doing 
more regular updates on long range planning projects. And Mr. Scott Whiteman is here tonight to deliver the first in a series of updates related to um, a variety of his projects. So I would um, ask that we also add that at the end of your agenda. Great, thank you very much. Oh, I'm, but I'm not done. <laughs> But wait, there's more. Wait, there's more. So Ms. Smith wanted me to relay that she will be sending out via email the uh, what's next, what come, upcoming items, since she was not able to do that. Um, and last thing is I'd like to state for the record that all public notice requirements were carried out in accordance with state and local law, and affidavits for all those notices are on file in the planning department. Excellent. Thank you. I'll entertain a motion for the approved updated agenda with the addition of the two agenda items, the, the, the new projects and the 2019 meeting dates. Motion to approve adjustments to the agenda as stated. Second. Okay, moved and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Great, thank you very much. So we will move to our first item on the agenda. This is a zoning map change for Comstock Industrial Case Z18-00010. Thank you. We'll start with the staff report. Good evening, I'm Jamie Sunyak with the Planning Department. I will be presenting case number Z180010. This is Comstock Industrial. The applicant is Patrick Biker of Morningstar Law Group. The subject site is two parcels, 4509 Page Road and 5505 Comstock Road. Um, the property is currently located within the uh, city limits pending an annexation application. Um, the applicant proposes to change the two parcels, uh, which total um, 7.879 acres, from rural residential to industrial light. There is no development plan associated with this request. The property is designated industrial on the future land use map, which is consistent with the rezoning request, and the proposal is for all uses um, within the industrial light district. Uh, the aerial map shows the two properties highlighted in uh, Red Hatch. Um, they are currently located uh, within the southeastern portion of the county um, near the Wake County border. They are bisected by Comstec Road. Um, the northern property is triangular in shape and it is um, 0.691 acres in size. Um, and the southern property is the larger of the two uh, that is 7.189 acres. Um, the site is located within the suburban tier and the Noose River uh, Basin. Um, these uh, uh, photos depict the existing site conditions in some of the area surrounding um, the properties uh, as shown on the aerial and also in the photos are, are vacant and heavily wooded. Um, the southern property contains a floodplain and stream corridor along the eastern property boundary. Um, there are wooded lands uh, to the west and to the north. There's a medical building under construction at the corner of Page Road in Arrington uh, Park Drive. <clears throat> there are uh, residential developments to the south and to the east. Comstock Road ends at the Wake County border and a school is located on the north side at the terminus of the road. Um, and there are um, a, Additionally, there are vacant woodlands and overhead utility lines located to the east. Um, also, Page Park and Sterling Residential Developments are located to the northwest off of Page Road. This slide shows on the left the existing zoning. Um, the properties are in the rural residential yellow um, shade, and on the right, they are highlighted. Um, in purple, uh, proposed for industrial light. This is the future land use map, um, which shows the property um, in purple, which is the industrial designation, as well as small piece um, within the recreation open space, which will, which will not change. 
This um, slide highlights the um, industrial light dimensional standards, just giving you an idea of um, if and when a development occurs, some of the standards that they would have to adhere to. And in terms of consistency, consistency with the comprehensive plan and policies, um, the property is consistent with, um, or the proposed industrial light zoning designation rather is um, consistent with the current industrial designation on the future land use map and applicable policies. Um, it is consistent with policy 231A as the proposed industrial zoning is compatible with the office and institutional zoning to the west, the mixed use uh, zoning to the south and to the east, and the industrial light zoning to the west um, as it allows many of the same uses, um, as well as uh, policy 232 a, the existing infrastructure, uh, such as the roads, water, and sewer capacity are sufficient to accommodate the potential impacts. Staff determines that this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances, and I will be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. We will open the public hearing, and we have one individual signed up, Mr. Patrick Biker. Good evening. Good evening, Chair Busby, Vice Chair Hyman, members of the Planning Commission. I'm Patrick Biker with Morningstar Law Group. I live at 2614 Stewart Drive here in Durham. Let the record reflect I'm here tonight so that Neil Ghosh can have the night off. <laughs> I'm here tonight representing Page Road Land Co. LLC for this uh, zoning map change. And I first of all want to thank Jamie for an outstanding staff report on this item. Uh, next, I'd like to discuss briefly our team's decision not to submit a development plan with the zoning map change to IL. Um, our client is just the property owner and not a developer. And uh, we do not have an end user in mind or under contract or, or any relationship in regard to the 7.8 acres that you all are looking at tonight. However, what we do think is important for the Planning Commission to consider is that Duke University Health System owns about 45 acres to the south of this site. Uh, it's under construction as Commissioner Brine shared with me, uh, the first phase. And the IL district gives our client flexibility to serve the needs that arise from whatever Duke Health System does with its new campus in this location. The IL district allows for a limited service hotel or medical office space or a restaurant, depending on what use or uses would be most synergistic with Duke Health's services at this location. Since we do not have an end user at this time, it's impossible to scope a traffic impact analysis. But once an end user is identified, the TIA will be done in conjunction with the site plan. I also think it's important to note that this area of Durham, which is east of Page Road and west of 540, and then south of Logistics Way, is developing as a good quality light industrial area. Many of you on the Planning Commission will remember the zoning map change for Long Beverage earlier this year. And Long Beverage is less than a mile north of the property you all are looking at tonight. Keep in mind, Durham City ordinances, including but not limited to the UDO, place limits on the noise, lighting, uh, building height of no more than 50 feet, and also impose significant project boundary buffers under UDO section 9.4. Accordingly, for all those reasons, we respectfully ask for your recommendation of approval. Uh, I know you wanted me to take up all 10 minutes, but I'm sorry to let you down in that regard. Um, and so if you have any questions, I'll be happy to try and answer them. Thank you very much for your time tonight. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak on this item before we close the public hearing? Okay, seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. And commissioners, questions or comments? Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I'm just curious as uh, in regards to the request uh, absent of a development plan, just for my uh, curious nature. Uh, it seems that the the request that you're making is in line with the future uh, land use map. Mm -hmm. And so is it, can you provide some thinking on absent of this request being granted, would it make it more difficult for you to shop this parcel to end users? Or uh, the flip side is why is it, would it be possible for you to shop this parcel to potential end users knowing that the, the future land use map is essentially in your favor and what you're asking. No, the, the problem we've got, Commissioner Johnson, is that the property right now is on rural residential with no access to water and sewer. 
which makes it adequate for playing cornhole. But I don't know what else you could do on it. And you could build, it's in your staff report, you could build houses on one acre lots with well septic, so it's not even marketable with its current entitlements. I don't think anybody really looks at the future land use map in terms of end users. They would say, well, that's what the future land use map says, but in terms of the entitlements, it's whatever it is in your staff report. I apologize for not remembering it off the top of my head, but what is it, nine single family houses? Uh, that, that, that dog won't hunt when you go out to the market. Mm -hmm. So what, what does make sense, and I remember driving up and down Page Road with Commissioner Becky Heron, talk about a blast from the past, and her saying we really need more industrial development out in this part of Durham. So it's it's been a goal for our community for, golly, that must have been 10, that was probably 15 years ago. Uh, it's, and we're seeing it happen with the Long Beverage case that y'all approved, and that, that didn't have a development plan for the expansion of Long Beverage. Um, so in terms of uh, can we market it with our, our zoning, you really can. Hope that answers your question. A follow up, please. And so is the intent of the uh, property owners to sell this land to a developer or to lease it for development? Probably sell it. And so I, I asked this question because, you know, there are cases where the zoning, a zoning change would increase the value of it, but a developer or acquirer of the property would make the purchase contingent on them being able to mm -hmm. get, oh. you know, the request that you're coming here tonight with. So I'm just, you yeah, know. That's usually what happens. I'm usually here representing a developer who has a piece right. of property under contract, but that's just not the case here. He's a uh, property owner, and um, we looked at the future land use map. We looked at the Duke Health System campus, and we decided that residential really wasn't a good fit here, so IL makes makes good sense, and it's in line with Durham County and the city of Durham's goals for this part of our community. Okay. Good Thanks. question. Thank you. Other commissioners? Yes, sir. Commissioner Miller, and then Commissioner Hornbuckle. Patrick, uh, I agree with you that uh, because the property is uh, currently designated uh, for industrial use under the future land use map, that your uh, zoning's in line with that and is supported by uh, current city policy, but you're, I have to push back a little bit on your statement that what's happening over here is uh, an industrial area when in the immediate vicinity of this property, what's happening is residential. I drove all over. Mm, oh, yeah, area. sure, it's, to the it's, south. It's area. residential in every direction except for the, for yeah, the Duke, I, Duke project. And then mm -hmm. down at the end of Comstock, there is a non-residential development down there, yeah. but that's in this um, other purple area. Yeah, I appreciate that. I, I'm only referring to the area that if you went north from this site to Long Beverage. Right, and I appreciate that. All throughout this area between the, what I would call the suburban area, the, the real, the developed suburban area and the Wake County line on this side of I-40, uh, we have, uh, we're developing a crazy quilt of industrial and residential projects, which I, I wish we were not doing, but since we get these requests one at a time, and we have a tendency not to remember what we did already. Uh, I would love to have us look sometime and try to make sense out of this in terms of uh, some sort of comprehensive approach to uh, uh, redrawing the lines on the future land use map. But in terms of this particular project, because of its proximity to the, to the Duke development just further down, and because uh, I noticed that you say that you're, you're a use for this property may be a hotel. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not that far from I-40. The land between uh, here and I-40 is, uh, uh, some of it is uh, clearly wet and not a good not good site for any kind of development. That's about all we have left in Durham. Um, so I, I can't say that the way this is shaping up here, um, uh, a hotel use or an office use uh, consistent with the uh, industrial light uh, zone bothers me that much. I would not want to see a long beverage type facility here, but uh, it wouldn't be the end of the world, I suppose. I'm going to support your request, but I do think that, that in this particular part of the county, uh, residential seems to be the trend. Yeah, it's a pretty small parcel, so to perhaps allay your concerns, south of Comstock Road, it's only seven acres, so it's not like it's a 
20, 25 acre site that we can build something on. If I may, Mr. Chairman, uh, Patrick just reminded me with his comment about the small parcel. Is the parcel on the other side of Comstock Road, the portion of this property that's over there, is that really usable for much zone? Probably be something uh, light we light industrial meeting our open space requirement. Hmm? Probably be used for meeting our open space requirement. All right. That makes sense. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thanks. Commissioner Hornbuckle, do you have a question? Yes, sir, Mr. Barker. I, I totally support the project. I just had one question. Yes, sir. I remember many years ago when old Mr. Page was still living in that area, oh, yeah, you right. know, and uh, I used to, as a deputy, I would stop in and speak with him. Sure. Part of that somewhere, and I, I see a lot of it is still some, some wooded area. Yes, sir. I recall him taking me back in the woods back in there, and he had a cemetery for his old mules back that. in there. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I didn't know if that was on this, no, this piece. No, it's to the north. It's, it's a little the north, north of that. Page family I knew he had a large chunk of land in there, yeah. and that's why I just between wanted to. Between this site and Longbow. I just wanted that's to see if it was, you know, if, if, if that was in this piece or not. I couldn't recall where it was. Well, it's been is, many years My belief ago. is not. Mules. But, yeah, there's still Page family property between this site and the Long Beverage site that y'all Right, well, he's of. probably the only person ever did, but he did have a little no, I remember that. in yeah, there. I, there I, yeah, no, his old uh, with, uh, farm mules. Yeah, if referred to the residential projects at Commissioner Miller, we had to work with the Page family on temporary construction easements for the widenings of Page Road up and down through there, and so we've spent some quality time with the Page family. Hey, Commissioner Gibbs. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. I keep pushing this button. I'm, I'm still not used to this on-off thing. Anyway, uh, we're really learning some interesting history. I'm, I always like to hear those kind of comments because it does uh, go to Durham's character, Durham County, Durham City, whatever. But I, I intend to support this. It's a... Uh, uh, any of the uh, allowed uses, I think, would would work in this uh, on this tract. Uh, when there is no development plan, uh, it's up to our imaginations as to what could go here. But at any rate, uh, I think it's a good move for the property owner, uh, and it's not out of step with anything else that's going on around this patchwork area. So I, I intend to support it. Uh, that's all, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Commissioner Baker? Um, I have a comment. I don't have any questions. So uh, if anyone else has questions before I say anything. Um, the floor is yours. All right. Um, so I want to thank staff um, for the work that they did on this, um, for the analysis that they conducted. Um, I think that they did a really good job. Um, uh, this has lots of great information, um, made it really easy to understand um, what was being proposed. Um, they did their legwork. Um, I want to make a, a quick statement. I don't necessarily want to persuade anyone of, any, um, of anything here, but I do want to voice um, some of my concerns with this project. Um, it's coming before the Planning Commission, and I think that we can make a thoughtful recommendation uh, for the best of the health, welfare, and, and safety of the community. Um, I noticed that uh, in the evaluation and assessment report that we received from staff um, under Section 5, Transportation, um, it mentions uh, recent trends indicating growing locational demand um, for housing in, in more um, compact neighborhoods. It also mentions that uh, the Triangle region has historically been one of the nation's um, most sprawling regions. So I, I think that that's something to, to sort of step back and consider when we're looking at, yes, it's a small, it's a small parcel in a, in a big city. Um, Yes, sprawl is, is, a, is a big word, and it can mean a lot of different things. Um, but this is, in many ways, or can be sprawl. It could be a lot of different things. Um, it could turn into industrial. It could um, become a, a wrecking yard. Um, it, could, it could be used for um, something, a use that's more compatible with adjacent neighborhoods or with 
um, hospital uses. And so I think that that's something to, to consider. It's also currently um, being used. It's being used, um, it's forested. Uh, that's that's um, important for society, you know, the, the, the trees and the wildlife habitat and uh, everything that else that goes along with it, um, the, the positive impacts that that has on, on the climate and those types of things, it's not gonna remain that way. Um, I also don't believe that it will be developed residentially. I don't think it'll be developed as rural residential. And so um, there are opportunities, a lot of great opportunities um, for this site. Um, to me, zoning this industrial light, um, which actually permits not industrial, not just industrial, but um, a lot of commercial and other types of uses, in many ways is, is kind of a blank check. Uh, it, it's a blank check. And right now we, we kind of have an opportunity um, to say, well, you know, we can, why don't, why don't we come back with something else? Um, I don't even think that uh, a development plan is necessary. Um, uh, I don't think that we always need to know at this stage what's, what's going to be developed. I think that those types of things, um, you know, can be handled by staff and, and can be handled in the UDO. Um, so I, I wanted to voice that concern. Um, just wanted to say that I, I probably won't be supporting this, um, but uh, just wanted to voice that. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Commissioner uh, Johnson? I just want to comment. Uh, oh, well, I, well, let's just wait uh, one moment. There, uh, since no one has directly asked you uh, yeah. a question at this point, we need to, to wait a moment. Yeah, I just want to correct you. So my um, comments is in, is in response to what was just shared here. So uh, I'm just curious as to um, is it the, uh, the absence of a development plan, which you stated is not necessarily needed here, but what would you need to see to assuage whatever discontent that has you not in support of what's before us this evening? So I would be interested in something um, that guarantees that we'll see some sort of development that would be, um, that would provide green building, that would um, potentially provide less of a sprawl type of development. We don't just need to think, in my view, we don't just need to think about the uses. Um, we also need to look at, at the form. Um, these, this requires huge, huge setbacks off of the street. And I think that we'll ultimately end up seeing a lot of the sort of business as usual type of commercial development or hotel or, or whatever, um, whatever the, the next property owner wishes to, to put on their property. Um, so uh, I think the lack, the lack of, of knowing, the lack of guarantees that something good, um, something that doesn't perpetuate the types of sprawl development that we see um, that, that is a little bit more sustainable um, in its orientation. And of course, you know, we have to consider the context of the area um, yes, it's it's not developed. It's not going to be a new urban community. It's not going to develop out that way. But uh, you know, we only get a few opportunities to really be critical of of uh, these types of applications. And uh, zoning is a powerful tool. And so um, I think that you know, when when we're looking at it, when we're looking at the zoning, um, that, that this is an important moment uh, for us to be considering. You know, do we want to push the community forward, and do we want to be talking a little bit more about more sustainable development? Uh, Commissioner Johnson, any other questions? Oh, thanks. Uh, and Mr. Baker, I'd I'd like to ask give you the opportunity to make any additional if comments and reactions. I believe there was a reference to a wrecking junk or salvage yard that would require a special use permit from the Board yes. of Adjustment. Yeah. It is not an as of right use in this district. That's correct. I, again, I want to. Thank Jamie for putting a very for putting the list here, and I believe the the list of, our, of permitted uses demonstrates that uh, this request is appropriate for this section of Durham County. Thank you, Commissioner Alturk. Thank you, Chair. Um, I wanted to just highlight what um, BPAC's recommendations were, um, and and I wanted to ask staff a question. So, because we don't have a development plan. Um, 
we, we typically see a commitment to five feet of asphalt for a future bike lane. Um, is there anything in the UDO that would require a bike lane without that commitment for this property? Or is, I assume the answer is no, right? Erlene Thomas, Transportation. So no, there's nothing in the UDO that would automatically require the additional asphalt for bicycle lane. Um, if there are um, facilities planned in our approved bicycle and transportation plans, we would look at those as, as they apply. And what would those be, those facilities? Or what do you mean if they are approved in the bike and plan? In the Is long range. In the, in the long, okay. Plans. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, and then I, I guess I am curious why. I mean, I'll just I'll reiterate the question that BPAC had, uh, which is why not, you know, propose a commercial designation for this rather than an I/O to uh, more align with the potential proposed use. Uh, because commercial would uh, support residential uses, and I agree with Commissioner Miller. I don't think. We need more residential in this part of town. So that's why we did not pursue a commercial zoning designation. Okay. Thank you. Oh, wait. Yeah. Commissioner Miller. Thank you. So to follow up on what Commissioner Alturk has said, uh, I was looking at the BPAC recommendations too, and, and um, I know the staff has, has added comments to the comments. Um, I find nothing wrong with either of the two questions that BPAC has raised, and my, we have rehearsed them for you and talked about them, and I don't think that we would necessarily all come down on the same side of it, but I do think they are appropriate, and so um, and I'm grateful for, to them for raising uh, both issues. I mean, ultimately, we have to send this forward with a recommendation either for or against, and I think these are considerations that all of us can, can weigh, and I'm, I'm grateful to them for bringing them up. Um, in this instance, uh, I, if, if I may respond to your point, I think that had they applied under, under the BPAC question number two um, here, uh, an application for another zoning category, like office institutional or commercial, would have required uh, a uh, comprehensive plan change. Right. And they probably didn't want to incur the expense, quite frankly. I, I'm just guessing Patrick can answer that. So. If he's going to change the zone, he's looking for zones that are allowable in that purple part of the map, and there are essentially two of them, industrial and industrial light. So I think that's what's driving this, is a desire to be consistent with the, the future land use map and the comprehensive plan. And I, I get that. Uh, uh, I also would prefer more specific understanding. I also don't like to write blank checks but considering the broadest range of things that might go in here and assuming, uh, as we are required to do by North Carolina law, that uh, the developer will uh, put in as much as, uh, that if the developer put in as much as he could under the, the table of, of permitted uses, would it be okay? And it, to me, the answer to there under, in this case is yes, so that's why I'm voting for it. Um, I admit that if it is possible, I suppose, I would be disappointed if other things went in one over another, but it doesn't worry me that much. But I, I get the point. Uh, it's a good one, and I think it's something we really need to look at. Uh, but I would like to look at it not seven acres or nine acres at a time. would really love to have a session where we sat down and we got a bigger map of this portion of Durham County and decided whether or not our future land use map actually makes sense. Commissioner Althurk. Um, Commissioner, Commissioner Miller's comments reminded me of a question that I had for staff, which was <clears throat> um, that I also was struck by the comment from staff that it's not appropriate for BPAC to recommend the type of application. And I'm, I'm because this is the first time I've seen this from staff, and I'm curious because I am the liaison to BPAC, so I can tell them why they should or should not do this. Sarah Young with the Planning Department again. So BPAC's role in the development review process is limited to making recommendations on bicycle and pedestrian related 
um, issues, amenities, related to what our plans say we need, um, what the ordinance may require, although there is also transportation staff that looks at those same things. So uh, we have seen a consistent trend from BPAC asking applicants, um, basically questioning why they didn't do a development plan. There are lots of things, and that's really kind of outside the purview of BPAC. But if, if their goal is to promote bike and pedestrian facilities without a development plan, they cannot assess whether or is that, is that not correct, that they cannot assess whether there will be a five-foot asphalt for future bike lane? That, so that's, it seems think, to me within Honestly, the part of it, I think, is also an educational issue okay. um, in terms of being familiar with what is on our adopted plans in terms of future proposed um, <coughs> amenities and transportation improvements, which will, look, will be asked for at the time of site plan, and the um, developers will have to comply at that point. So one of the things that Grace Smith and I have talked about is actually coming, it's a little premature, but you asked, so I'll answer, is coming to BPAC at an upcoming meeting and having a talk about the role of BPAC in development review and how to make sure that you guys find um, the most effective avenues to push good transportation planning and good multimodal um, amenities and connectivity through what you're doing. Um, but we have consistently heard from applicants their concern that they're being put on the spot and basically interrogated, questioned as to why they haven't done a development plan and not seeing the direct relevance. Okay, thank you. If I may, one more question for Stuart. Um, and, and again, this is the, on the issue of whether commercial or industrial designation makes sense. So the proposal is for potentially a commercial development in an industrial zoning, but it would be consistent with a comprehensive plan. Is that preferable to having you know, the use not align with the future land use map. So, you know, to, to me, this seems like there's, you can either be consistent with the future land use map or you can, the uses can be consistent, right? And so I, what, what is preferable from a planning perspective? So honestly, I, I think that's where there is some judgment and some give and take. The future land use <clears throat> map is intended to be the city's and the county's plan for this is the type in general, of development that we want in this area. So looking at it from that perspective, at some point the city and the county said, industrial is what we want here. Now, having said that, most, if you look at our ordinance, most of our zoning districts, except for the residential ones, allow a whole lot of different uses. They really are not single-use districts um, strictly. And so you do get some amount of overlap. Um, part of that, I think, is good in that you know we have a comprehensive plan policy that talks about um, contiguous development and things kind of uh, feeling like they continue to merge and fit into each other. If we took that really literally, you could only ever have one use in the entire city and county, right? Because you'd have to constantly match what was next to you. And that's clearly not the intent. So I think the intent of having zoning districts that allow kind of a range of use, uses that can kind of merge from one category to another helps do that blending of contiguous development where you may have different land uses, uh, I mean, different specific uses in a land use category. Thank you, sir. Great, thank you. Any other questions or comments? And before we, we take a motion, because I don't see any other questions and comments, I do just wanna say, I actually I appreciate this conversation. I think it's really helpful for us to be able to ask direct questions of staff or the applicants or talk to each other uh, and so I, I think that's really healthy, and I always learn something from that as well. So I appreciate this conversation and some of the questions that, that have been raised. Uh, that said, I will look for a motion. Mr. Chairman, if I may. You may. Uh, I move that we send case Z1810 forward to the City Council with a favorable recommendation. Second. And just for the record, this is case Z180010. Did I? Yeah. Okay. I th when, think, when you add three zeros together, I still think you have nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I never stop learning at this meeting. <laughs> Properly moved and seconded, and we'll have a roll call vote, please. No. Uh, learning. Mr. Alturk. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Baker? No. Mr. Bryan? Yes. Ms. Satterfield? Yes. Ms. Durkin? Yes. Ms. Hyman? Yes. Mr. Busby? Yes. Mr. Miller? Yes. Mr. Kenshin? Yes. 
Mr. Hornbuckle? Yes. And Mr. Gibbs? Yes. Motion passes 10 to 2. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Biker. Next on our agenda, appropriately, is a text amendment to the Unified Development Ordinance. This is case TC18 quadruple zero eight, text only development plan. Thank you, Michael Stock with the Planning Department. Um, text amendment TC180008 uh, would establish a limited text only development plan option for zoning map changes requests to allow proffers that limit uses allowed within a requested zoning district. Uh, this is alternative limited in scope as staff develops a more comprehensive set of revisions for alternatives to the current development plan requirements. Um, basically, uh, the proposed changes uh, would be, or the commitments that would be made would be incorporated into the ordinance uh, for adoption. Commitments will be limited at this time to proposed uses and can be proffered at any time during the review and adoption process. And the D designation that you see commonly for development, uh, specifically for development plans, would still apply to the zoning designation. Um, it's in response to um, frustrations we've We've heard from elected officials and even, uh, I believe, even some uh, uh, planning commissioners that um, there are really just two options before you at this time, a straight rezoning that you just heard right now and the full-blown development plan option, which requires an applicant to put forward uh, thousands of dollars worth of consulting time to develop plans that show um, a lot of things, but ultimately, um, the goal of the development plan is to allow uh, applicants to proffer additional commitments that are beyond ordinance requirements. Um, and many of those commitments don't need to be graphic in nature. Um, sometimes they're very helpful to be graphic in nature, but a lot of times they don't. And, and we've seen, we've sat here in meetings and like an applicant would just want to commit to a certain height um, and they don't have a development plan and, and everybody would be fine if they could just commit to that height and the applicant was ready to do it but there wasn't a real option between uh, the two that were already on the book. So this is an initial step. We are also taking a look at um, uh, if and when this does get adopted, um, furthering it to develop a more comprehensive list of items that could be in a text-only development plan and what that would look like in more detail if you're adding more items to it. Maybe there are some graphics that could be added to it to uh, uh, add to what the, the meaning of that commitment is without calling, without having to do uh, those larger development plan uh, projects. Um, again, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you. And we do have a public hearing for this item as well. Is that correct? Yes. We will see if there's any anyone signed up. No one has signed up to speak. Anyone who would like to speak? Great. Okay. Seeing none. Commissioners, questions, comments, feedback? Commissioner Bryan. Uh, in view of the case that we just dealt with, one potential use that I see for this, and I want to make sure I understand how it would work, is that, you know, they didn't know exactly what they wanted to do, but they could have provided a list of things that they would not do. Is that correct? That's correct. At this point, it would be, list, it would be limited to a range of uses that you'd find on your use table, but the goal is to even go beyond just that list and be able to provide those, those proffers that don't require a, a, a visual okay. or graphic. Thank you. Okay. Commissioner Durkin. I just had a question on the visual thing. Is there any kind of room to provide a visual depiction of some sort in this capacity outside of a full-blown development plan? Uh, for this- It's kind of nice to visualize especially placement of certain things or right well in this in this limited case you're just talking about uses so you're either okay. you're saying you can't do a shopping center or you're okay with a shopping center for that within that zoning district um, the idea that we're looking at when we go beyond that list when you see some text amendment in the future would be okay if you are going to um, uh, the applicant was agreeing to a larger buffer. Do you need a full-blown development plan for that specifying larger buffer, or was text and maybe a supplemental graphic with that text is, is doable? So that's what we're looking at for the future. Commissioner Miller? So you said something that um, interested me, because uh, I read it as being, we're really just kind of fooling with the use table. 
but you suggested that we've had cases, and we have had cases where it would be easy to add a text commitment saying that it's not going to be that instead of the 50 feet, it's going to be 42 feet. Uh, that's not use. Would that be allowed under this? As no, the, I, I'll just add, as an example of right. that was just something that was on top but, of. The head but you say that may be where we're headed. That's where we are heading with it. Once I've been working with uh, with Jamie's team with developing and and looking at what kind of revisions we can make to add that more more robust third option or middle ground option um, that would include maybe height limitations and other limitate other proffers or limitations offered by um, the applicant. Um, that again wouldn't necessarily require a graphic. And as we, I, we were given a direction to kind of go with just uses at this point in time. And procedurally, as I understand it, uh, that at least as it's currently proposed, right up until City Council, we could fool with items on the on the use table, you know, pull them off, right, uh, or say these three only, right. or this one only. Do that right up till then. Uh, without causing delay. Correct. Yeah, the idea is to allow that flexibility for when a public hearing happens, or even through the application review process that something comes about when they've been talking to neighbors or something like that, um, to allow that flexibility to make those proffers without having to uh, change the application substantially. Right, because messing with the use table, we're, 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 we're moving the checkers, but we're not we're not making them bigger or smaller or, or different shapes. Right. All right, thank you. I understand, I, I appreciate it. Sure. And, and actually as a follow-up to, to Commissioner Miller, if, if I may, um, so basically I, I just want to understand the, the way this would work is that a staff report might indicate if the applicant at, during the application process before it even came to us took use of this, right? It might say they've already eliminated these. We would still see the use table Mm -hmm. But it would note that these these uses have been eliminated or, or taken off, and then obviously during the the hearing process, we might go further than that. That makes that. absolutely sense. Yeah, I believe they would incorporate that into your staff. And at some point, this would be written down and made a part of the application. Yes. What ultimately, um, as it occurs, so either they amend their application during review, or when they go and have your public hearing and you make your recommendation of, of approval, it would be with the proffers of whatever uses they've limited themselves to. Um, and then that would move forward to the elected bodies, and uh, city council or board of commissioners, depending on the jurisdiction, and then they would see that and they'd be, that's good, or we want more, or whatever. And then whatever is adopted is just, there's always an ad ordinance of adoption, and those commitments would be just be part of that ordinance of adoption. Mm -hmm. Great. Commissioner Johnson. Thank you. So just to make sure I heard uh, um, what I heard is I'm interpreting it correctly. So when Ms., uh, Mr. Miller says that this tool will be able to be utilized up until council acts on it. So if we go through the process and do whatever we do with the use tables, restriction exceptions or whatnot, and it's voted upon it can still change between what we vote on and what the, the council ultimately decides on. So the, the council can come and change the uses from what was voted on here in regards well, to they, the they, they can, yes. I mean, it would be a proffer from the applicant. I mean, it's not then mandating a change. Okay. Uh, development plans are meant to be proffers agreed to by the developer, just as you you would with a development plan in front of you now. You'd raise a concern, and they'd say, oh, yeah, you know what, how we can address this concern? We can limit this use so we don't allow the wrecking, wrecking yard or whatever. And then you guys say, that's great. Could we confirm with staff that that's an appropriate committed element? And it's just, it's the same process, except there's no big plans in front of you. It's just limiting to those kinds of proffers that you normally see anyway. Mm -hmm. well, one, one quick follow-up, because uh, some, I may be a little fatigued mentally, so help me out here. So the way it currently works here in, in the sense that if a development plan comes before this body and we vote on it favorably, let's say we voted on it favorably for the council, can that development plan be changed with, during the consideration by the council yeah. itself? They have the authority to do that, yes. Yep. Okay, so, so basically... I mean, at the hearing, there's authority for that to happen. It's kind of, so this will be pretty much consistent with how that... Pro okay. Exactly. There's... It's still a development plan, it's just text only. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Commissioner Miller? But there is a point between, it, between the, the case being 
coming to us and the time it gets to council where proposed changes become so substantial, there's, there's a magic line that can get crossed and then it's a do-over. Right. But we're declaring in the way this ordinance is written that if this is if you're just moving items in and out of the table of uses within the applied for zone, that's not substantial. That's not a do-over. Right, right. It's really enabling the applicant to address concerns. It's more about form than it is about substance. Right. And because even today, if we had all the maps and everything, if all we changed were commitments uh, about what what items in the table of permitted uses would be in or out, you wouldn't consider that to be substantial. No, I think that would be a pretty straightforward, you know, list. And that gets at your cons the concern of what we're talking about for the next step. We want to kind of go over that list of things that may, it, what are substantial and not substantial, that kind of things. And, and it's going to be a tricky balance. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Johnson? And so I was just curious. So there, should we assume that there's no cost associated with the applicant using this potential tool. So there's no, like it costs to do a development plan, but there's additional costs for full blown development plans. I don't think that you're looking, I don't know what the fee schedule would be like for this. That's something that I haven't, that yeah. yeah, that needs to be finalized. There would be a fee for the individual person zoning, but it would have to be added to the tile because it's like right. it's less for staff to review. Yeah. And our fees have by state law have to align with the water quality assessment for the city. Yeah. I follow. And so how much effort are you uh, assuming you would have to do to look at a use table and I would imagine it would be minimal effort. So can we assume that the cost, the fee, the relative fee would be minimal? I cannot make any assumptions at this point. I will let that be for the assistant director. To <laughs> 45 cents. So like, like I said, chances are it may be very comparable to what a straight zoning is. Um, we haven't looked at that yet. There will be a fee, though. I don't want to. I don't want people in the audience or at home getting the idea that this is a free rezoning. So when we say that there is none, let's be clear that there is uh, no less, less than a development plan zoning. Um, and certainly, the applicant. The main savings is that they don't have to hire a consultant to spend thousands of dollars developing the drawings. That right there is a cost savings, a major cost savings. It's a lot, lot, lot more than the fees. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure the citizens of Durham uh, understood that aspect of this request. Yep. Thank you for your questions. There, we have now learned there is no such thing as a free rezoning. <laughs> uh, I, I did want to say, I want to thank the staff. I, I think this is, this is a really good step in the right direction. I know many of us in, are not always comfortable voting for a case that doesn't have a development plan because of the large number of uses. And, and as you just saw, many of us still will We'll do it, but we're not always comfortable with it. This gives a level of comfort and moves us in the right direction and is very responsive to what you're hearing from, from us and obviously the governing bodies. I'm curious on the timing of the next phase. So, and I know you don't have the exact answers, but what's your sense of the next phase? How long do you think we will live with this interim regime if this does move forward and get approved, which I'm guessing it will? I would hope so. Um, yeah, um, that's a good question. Uh, we have a couple other thing, big things on our plate right now. Like we kind of like to at least get partially eaten up um, and digested. Um, but um, I'm thinking probably we'll take it back up early next year um, to start looking at that. Um, so this would be on the books for probably at least um, six to eight months before um, anything's really moving forward. And it might give it time to see how things work and play out too, which might be helpful. Great, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Mr. Chairman, if I may. You may. Uh, I move that we send the uh, text amendment 18 quadruple zero eight forward to the city council and the board of county commissioners with a favorable recommendation. Second. Moved and seconded. Do we need a roll call on this? Or? Do we have a voice vote? We'll have a voice vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you again to the staff. Thank you. Appreciate that. Our final public hearing this evening is the text amendment to the Durham Comprehensive Plan. So this is A18001, the year.
the evaluation and assessment report. And we'll start with the staff report. Good evening. I'm Laura Woods with the Planning Department. And uh, as you stated, this is uh, case A18000001, our annual evaluation and assessment report. Um, for those of you, the few of you I recognize from the last time I was here, uh, you'll, you, you will recall that we usually do this earlier in the year. Unfortunately, this year, a host of special projects with tight deadlines kind of scuppered our plans, as it were. So we're a little late. Uh, do not be surprised if the next annual report uh, comes to you uh, in the spring, in about five months. So let us get started. Um, the purpose of the report is to rectify differences between the city and county future land use maps, report on progress of plan implementation, proposed changes to policy language, proposed technical updates to the future land use map, and forecast planning issues and trends. In 2017, the city approved nine changes to the future land use map and the uh, county, not a one. Uh, the change in land use acreages was fairly small with the most significant being about 47 additional acres of commercial land and about 32 acres of low medium density residential with small um, declines, industrial land and office. Um, oh, before we get to that, um, the details on these plan amendments and also on zoning cases are in your staff report in tables and um, the locations are shown in uh, maps in the report. Um, we have one policy recommendation change that I want to highlight. This is proposed by the planning department and it has to do with the impact on uh, housing affordability within neighborhood protection overlays. Um, if, you, if you don't mind, I'll read it out. Evaluate the net impact on housing affordability and housing supply in all received applications for neighborhood protection overlays and local historic districts. Planning staff shall recommend denial of MPO applications that have a negative impact on housing affordability or housing supply. This policy is intended to bring the comprehensive plan into conformance with um, affordable housing initiatives that are currently underway. Uh, we have one change recommended this year on the future land use map, and this is in the vicinity of Rose of Sharon Road. Um, it's actually an extension uh, represents an extension of Eno State River State Park. Three properties were acquired by the state, and those are indicated on the map shown here, uh, also in attachment three of your report. And not only do they offer an extension of the park, uh, they also uh, offer um, sort of a, um, uh, a path to the city's Durham, Durham, or the city of Durham's Spring Valley Park, or excuse me, Valley Springs Park. It's not one I'm familiar with. Haven't been that way. So that is the extent um, of our changes recommended. Um, we have expanded our um, trends this year since we have so very little changes. So I hope you don't, didn't mind the um, insight into uh, land use and demographic changes in Durham and our assessment of emerging trends. That concludes my report. Thank you. We will uh, open the public hearing, but we have no one that has signed up to speak. We'll give anyone in the audience the opportunity to speak. No one is coming forward, so we will close the public hearing. Questions from the commissioners? Commissioner Johnson? Uh, just a question in regards to the affordable housing impact assessment and the proposed recommendation. Um, 
uh, do you have an existing uh, uh, framework or method methodology of, of what that impact assessment entails? And if so, and if not, will that mean net impact on affordable housing in the city, or is it the net impact of the purview of whatever you know overlay area that is under consideration? The net impact within the historic district or the proposed MPF. Additional questions, Commissioner Johnson? Oh, thank you. You're good? Okay, Commissioner Satterfield? My question was along the same lines. What are the metrics that are going to be used mm -hmm. to determine what that net impact looks like? I think those yet to, have yet to be determined. Okay. Commissioner Miller? So I have a, a problem with it, too. Um, we do have policies in the um, comprehensive plan, at least my quick scan of it, to talk about what it is we want out of our historic districts uh, and some criteria that, that help us determine or measure of, uh, when one is appropriate and where we want them and where we don't. As far as I could find, we don't have any policy whatsoever in the comprehensive plan that even contemplates the MPO. Uh, and I have a problem with having a, with having a device in the zoning code called the Neighborhood Protection Overlay having a comprehensive plan that doesn't recognize it, and then adding a, a one policy in the comprehensive plan as it relates to the MPO, and it is unfavorable. Mm -hmm. uh, we just considered at our meeting last time uh, changes to the rules about applying for an MPO that make it so difficult. Why don't we just propose to eliminate it? Uh, because that seems what we're doing by, it's, it's death by a thousand cuts, and I, so I object to this policy. I don't think the metrics are there. Mm -hmm. um, I don't even know how you do it, um, how you evaluate it. I do think that the very good question is, is whether it's just inside the, the boundaries of the proposed district or whether it's a, a net effect across the, the jurisdiction. I also have a, this problem with if we're going to have policies that contemplate the MPO, we ought to start with policies that talk about where an MP, what we're trying to accomplish with an MPO uh, and put that in a comprehensive plan. And then if we want to curb uh, MPO applications uh, based upon uh, how they perform with regard to housing affordability and, and, uh, and uh, housing supply, then we can work that in there. But to have just a negative policy uh, no, and no policy guidance at all for, for, for the tool seems to me a lousy way to do comprehensive planning. So I'm going to vote against this. Any other commissioners? I, I, uh, Commissioner Durkin. I would just, um, in response to Commissioner Miller's statement, I'm excited that the staff is actually thinking about housing affordability and how we can bring that uh, metric into our decision-making process. So I'm really excited that even though this needs to be flushed out a lot, I'm excited by the idea that you're thinking about it and that we'll have more in front of us soon. So uh, I, thank you. I, I had a question as well. So I, I had concerns about this as well. I appreciate you raising it in your report and putting it directly in front of us because that was the one thing that jumped out at me as I read through this. So, and, and I agree with, with Commissioner Miller's concerns in a lot of regards. I think this is an important planning tool, if not the only citizen-driven planning tool where the citizens of this community are reacting to development proposals. This is the one tool that's available for citizens to bring something forward. Uh, that said, can you walk us through how you envision this would actually work? And I don't mean the metrics, but I mean if you decided, if the planning staff and it says shall recommend denial of an MPO application that has a negative impact on housing affordability or housing supply, what happens next? Is that just your recommendation in your report to us when it comes to the Planning Commission? And Because I know there's a couple different proposals now that are moving on separate tracks. So I'm trying to wrap my head around how does this actually move forward under current proposals and how might it move forward if what we saw last month also gets put forward. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah, I'm Scott Waver from the Planning Department. So it would just be a recommendation. The 
the uh, planning commission and the governing body could still adopt an NPO if we determined that it had some negative effect on housing supply. Uh, this is in response to a lot of what we heard during the adoption of the Old West Durham NPO, is that there was concern that it would be opening the door to a lot of neighborhoods trying to clamp down on the amount of housing or by greatly re increasing lot sizes or greatly reducing density. Um, we publicly stated that to council and I, probably the planning commission as well, that we believe the Old West Durham NPO did not do that. It just affected the scale of the housing in their, in their neighborhood. <clears throat> Excuse me, it did not actually affect the supply, but we felt we'd be in a better position to make that analysis if we had a comprehensive plan policy um, that was adopted. And just to follow up, and then then uh, other commissioners, I'll call on other commissioners. If the proposal, if I understood the proposal that we saw last month, and we we pulled that out, and we we will see that again at some point, I assume soon. That proposal would start with the staff making a, a recommendation to the governing body. Is that correct? If that proposal moved forward as currently drafted, and that may be getting reworked, so I don't I don't want to get us tied up in knots. I'm just trying to I'm trying to get a sense of I, I I still have concerns with it. I have less concerns if the if the staff report just says we're going to vote <laughs> denial because of concerns about affordability and the planning commission and the governing body will still then have that opportunity to review it and, and make their decision. I, I still have concerns. I just think it's a little different. Yeah, yeah. So absolutely, the planning staff does not get to approve or deny any zoning change, whether it's an NPO or a standard zoning map change. Um, so we would just, we would provide our analysis and a recommendation. Um, this is something that city council indicated they would would want to hear from us if they had another um, NPO application in front of them. I will say we are planning to bring the UDO changes about uh, the NPO process to your December meeting as a standalone item. Great, thank you. Commissioner Miller? So I am I'm reminded by some of the comments that people have made that in Article 3 of the UDO, we incorporate our comprehensive plan into our UDO. And so if the planning staff then makes its evaluation and says that, that this is a, a recommends denial, it seems to me we have a confused situation. Does the case end? I think the people who, I'm, I'm just terribly troubled by this and I don't think that, I know we've got, I've, I read in the newspaper and I know that we have an application for an MPO from one neighborhood and I know another neighborhood I read in the newspaper has met with the staff to explore where they're looking at it. I wonder if they understand that these barriers are being set up in front of it. Why can't we just have an MPO process that where the, it gets to the city council or the board of county commissioners and they say we're voting against it because we think it has a negative impact on housing affordability or housing supply. Why do we have to make these decisions before, before people even start, or after they start, and put all the work that we now propose to, to put them to, to get their application in front of people and find out that they wasted their time. I think this is, this is, this is the bad way of going about dealing with citizens and the one thing that they can do uh, that, that, that lets them participate as an initiator in our planning and zoning process. Commissioner Alturk. Thank you, Chair. Um, you know, last month we had the proposed text amendment and, and we discussed the NPO process and I mentioned that I did not like the fact that we were potentially making it more difficult. And so I was glad that we took that part of it, out of it because I, I do think the NPO process is an important one. Having said that, I, I like this policy. I don't see any problem with the planning staff making or, or assessing the effect on affordable housing. We can, we can still have an NPO process, but have the planning staff assess the impact on affordability. At the end of the day, like staff has, has said, it is our decision and it's really the governing body's decision whether to approve it or not. Um, you know, so I, I, I'm always in favor of more information about all applications. And if, you know, 
uh, I think we should make it easier to have an NPO process, but at the same time, we should have full information about the NPO and how and, it, and its effects. So maybe the issue that we're having here, and, and, and I'm not sure if this is exactly what it is for, for, for some folks, that the language says that the planning staff will recommend denial. So I'm, I'm wondering, you know, is there any way where you can still have the assessment but not recommend, I mean, just have a neutral recommendation? Um, if I may interject, um, as someone who does a, great, a good deal of the quantitative analysis for the planning department, um, as you know, the MPO process is an iterative process. It usually takes a long time. Um, there's no reason that the assessment could not take place during the development of the MPO, which would highlight a problem that might there might be with the MPO before it gets to the, the point of a public hearing, before it becomes a completed product. I will say, to, to answer Commissioner Alturk's uh, question, um, the Assistant Director just reminded me that the plain staff does, technically does not make recommendations on zoning changes, which this is one, so we'll refine that language so that it, it's not the, the it's, it's not so stark. So you will take out the sentence that says planning staff shall recommend denial? Yes. Okay, thank you. Great. Thank you, Commissioner Alturk. Okay, I see a few hands. So Commissioner Durkin and then Commissioner Johnson. Just a follow-up question related to Commissioner Alturk's comment. Um, does this, the staff include any kind of analysis on affordability in an NPO application currently, and, or is this the vehicle that would allow you to do that? We don't do it currently. Uh, we haven't had that many, so. Okay. Well, we only had one recently um, to be approved. We do, as Commissioner Miller said, we do have one, an application currently in, and we've heard talks of others. Okay. Commissioner Johnson? I just want to echo uh, support for the, the position uh, put forth by Commissioner Al Turk. I think that anytime we can get uh, value add information in front of us to help us with our deliberation and decision making, that, that is a good thing. However, I do I do agree with striking out the shall provide a recommendation because I mm -hmm. think that that's the charge of us. It's like that's punting the, the responsibilities of what us and then ultimately the council is responsible uh, from an elected officials and then an appointed uh, position to do. And so I am all for uh, additional value add information, but I do think that the responsibility is up to us to uh, make a decision regarding what do we do if that rec uh, the information is good, bad, or indifferent. Thank you. Commissioner Baker? Yeah, this is unre unrelated to, to that topic, but I, I wanted to um, just bring out a few items um, in, in the report that I think are interesting and, and worth highlighting. One is uh, ha under housing, on page nine, um, looking at the, the increases in housing in housing prices and housing costs, um, I think this is something that we need to be paying close attention to uh, as a planning commission and, and as a city, um, especially looking at the increases in rent um, because the, the types of people that are, are renting um, can often be um, people who um, have less means. And so, um, especially when rent is increasing at a higher rate than, than home prices, it makes it difficult to, to build up any wealth um, uh, to save up for a down payment if someone is trying to save up for a down payment to buy a house. Uh, I also wanted to just highlight something on page 13. Um, the um, design districts in the, in the UDO, uh, I don't have an in-depth knowledge of those, but I wanted to raise this, I just wanted to, applaud staff for, applaud staff and applaud everyone else who is behind um, putting in place the design districts. I think that this is something that's really important that's needed in, in the city. Um, I'd love to see more of this type of work um, happening. So that's all I wanted to say. Great. Thank you, Commissioner Baker. Commissioner Miller. So while we're, I'm going to tie the two together Impacts on housing affordability as they relate to NPOs and historic districts, quite frankly, isn't going to happen very often. Uh, if we really want to measure and get information in, on impacts on housing affordability and housing supply, we'd have this kind of analysis whenever we have uh, 
uh, certain kinds of, of major residential rezonings. Um, uh, of course, with our design district process, once we go to design district and we apply the design district d zones, there is no coming back. The developer builds what he wants to build inside the, 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 the rules of the code. Uh, but I'll point out in our design districts, we don't require any residential at all. Uh, we could build a design district out completely without any residential. And to me, that's a policy failure. Uh, and if we want to have our hands on the levers uh, to the extent that, that, the, that the levers can accomplish anything with regard to affordability and supply, I think we need some rules that address uh, uh, the requirements for housing in design districts, since the design districts are supposed to be around places where we have transit stops, uh, and that we also continue to have some sort of uh, analysis uh, of, or some way to analyze uh, affordability, uh, because when I, I look at the same charts and tables you have, uh, the the rents that are jumping up aren't. It's not the it's not the the eighteen hundred square foot single family house up in Argonne Hills. It's the new apartments that are being built around uh, parking structures all over downtown. That's where the rents are going up. That's where housing prices are leaping out of control. But we have already given up all controls. There's no point in studying uh, uh, or analyzing uh, housing afford the impacts on affordability or supply there because we created design districts and if you own a piece of property in there, your next step is a, is site plan and a building permit. It's not gonna come here. There's not gonna be a vote. So I would like to change that so that we stay in charge of, uh, of the place where action in housing is actually happening, not in historic districts, which <laughs> once in a blue moon, and NPOs, which at our current rate are once in every 12 years. So I don't see any other questions or comments. I did just want to follow up for staff, because I, I think you may have addressed my main concern. Do you mind just restating how you would plan to rephrase the language on the impacts on affordable, on affordability, on the housing affordability? I just want to make sure that, that I understand what you're planning to change, and it may be useful for other commissioners as well. Generally, not. I'm not going to hold you to the exact language, but ju just to I just want to make sure I understand we where will, you're changing language. We will definitely remove the phrase "planning staff shall recommend denial of the PMPO." We'll need to add some words generally so that it still makes a sentence. But I'm not sure what those are at this particular moment. But softer words. It will that definitely will be softer. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Can I Commissioner Alturk. This is unrelated to. To affordable housing, um, Laura, uh, you're the. I wanted to point to table. Sorry, figure one on page two. You show the net change in acres of the uh, flum. Mm -hmm. um, I was kind of hoping there would be something similar for the zoning map changes. Mm -hmm. um, do you have a sense of what? I mean, just looking at this list in table two, I was just trying to get a sense of, you know what the net changes would be for zoning map changes. Mm -hmm. um, I, so I guess, you know, if, if there was some way to relate that or relay that to us at some point, that would be, I think, useful. But I, I was thinking more broadly, you know, I assume you do this kind of analysis for the last five years, the last 10 years. I think it would be good for us to, to see those net change in acres over a longer time period. Because um, I think this is a really helpful you know, overview, and it would, I would love to see maybe, you know, five year or something, just so we can get a sense of when we're deciding to change from, you know, residential to commercial, you know, wh what are we doing to the landscape as a whole, right, and, and how is that really going to affect affordable housing long, long term? So if there's, you know, any way to pass that along to us at some point, that would be great. But Would you be satisfied if I did it with the next report? Yes, that would be great. Yeah, I'm, yeah. 
I'd hate to add more homework, but but that would be great. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions or comments? And then we'll accept a motion. Commissioner Miller? I'll ask my question directly to the floor. I'm sure there's an easy answer that would embarrass, make me embarrassed for having to ask the question. <laughs> I this might be worth the extra minute. <laughs> okay. I'll take a motion for approval at this point. Mr. Chairman, I move that we send uh, the text amendments to the comprehensive plan uh, embodied in A18 quadruple zero one uh, forward to the uh, City Council and Board of County Commissioners with a favorable recommendation. Second. Motion made and seconded. May and I clarify the motion? With the changes that the staff indicated with regard to the policy text change. Yes, thank you. Properly moved and seconded. We'll have a roll call vote for approval. Mr. Alturk? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Baker? Yes. Mr. Brine? Yes. Ms. Satterfield? Yes. Ms. Durkin? Yes. Ms. Hyman? Yes. Mr. Busby? Yes. Mr. Miller? No. Mr. Kenshin? Yes. Mr. Hornbuckle? Yes. And Mr. Gibbs? Yes. Passes 11 to 1. Thank you. And thanks to the staff for your work. We had two final items that we added, so we are going to review and vote on our 2019 meeting dates, and then we have project updates, which is a new feature to our meetings that we've been asking for for a while. Uh, staff, anything on the 2019 meeting dates you need to add? No? So we have the dates in front of us. This keeps us on a regular schedule. I move that we adopt the 2019 meeting schedule presented by staff. Second. Second. Great. Moved by Commissioner Bryan, seconded by Commissioner Hornbuckle and Commissioner Miller. Recognize you for a question or a comment on the motion? Never mind. Um, I'm a little concerned about the October 8th date, but it, um, since we always meet on Tuesday, and Tuesday is, is election day is always on Tuesday, I know we'll have a primary in October, and I'm concerned that it might be the 8th, but we probably don't know the dates yet, so there's no point in asking the question. Staff? We can always amend later if we need to. We, and we can do that. Yep, so okay. keep that in mind. We can amend later if we need to. That's a great clarification. Thank you. So all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Mark your calendars. <laughs> and finally, the long-awaited project updates. And again, we really appreciate that the staff is willing to take the time to put these together. We're hoping that these will be a regular feature when we don't have really, really long meeting agendas. <clears throat> Mr. Whiteman? Yes, and <clears throat> our intent is to do this uh, quarterly-ish. And we'll, if we have any meetings like your last one, we'll, uh, we'll wait till the next one. That's not my yes. Thank you. So uh, Mr. Stock is passing out a uh, memo that just has a brief summary of some of the big projects that we'll have coming for you soon. Um, I'll introduce them to you or uh, refresh your memory about some of these and uh, give you a, a quick status update. And feel free to ask me questions. So for the Patterson Place Compact Neighborhood, the, uh, we held our last public meeting in, at the end of October. Uh, we have general consensus from most, most of the stakeholders. Uh, we are planning to do a briefing for the Planning Commission at your next meeting, and then plan for the uh, public hearing at your January meeting. I'll say one, based on our last discussion, one, one thing to note about that is it will include a version of the affordable housing density bonus that was adopted as an interim that will be incorporated as a permanent in this district. Wow. The expanding housing choice project, uh, we'll be having public open houses here at City Hall to uh, discuss the details of the proposal. On November 27th and November 29th, we are planning for a Planning Commission briefing in January and the Planning Commission hearing in February. The uh, rewrite of the sign section of the UDO, which I know uh, Mike briefed you on a few months ago, we're still working on trying to find some compromises on a few sticky issues. Um, so we're 
we're not sure when it'll come back to you as a public hearing item, but sometime early next year. And the new comprehensive plan, for those of you who don't know, we received some funding in our budget to hire a consultant to help with the engagement portion of our comprehensive plan. I'd like to thank some of you for either volunteering or having your arm twisted into helping us select that consultant. We are, let's see, the week of November 26th, we're doing interviews for that, and we're planning to have a, a more engaged process to select the consultant than is normal in a, a uh, process like that. And so we're including community members, development community members, as well as uh, city and county staff. Great, thank you. Questions, comments? Commissioner Gibbs. I, my com <clears throat> excuse me. My comment is for the, uh, the last item. Uh, I really do appreciate the information that y'all compiled. I'm going to be referring to this little packet, this little thing for a long time. <laughs> there, there is some good information in here. Uh, and I do appreciate your efforts. Commissioner Alturk? Um, just to clarify, so the consultant is just for outreach, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And then are you hiring consultants to help with the actual plan or? We will we'll do that in-house. Okay. And have you started on that process or not quite yet? We have I'm just, just yeah, go ahead. barely begun doing some of the initial research and uh, we'll, we'll wait till we have the consultant on board to kind of free up our time to... Uh, and to have some of these other projects um, work their way through the system so we'll have more time to devote to the comprehensive plan. Great, thank you. Ms. Young? If I may, I, um, I noticed some concern perhaps expressed on some of the members' faces about um, the proximity of some of the PC briefings followed by public hearings and I just wanted to let you know that we're well aware that you wanted more space. Um, and however, these two projects are so far down the road, that there's no time now to, to have an early on briefing with the commission. These projects are nearing completion. And so that's why these couple of projects you see still follow the more traditional or previous model of one month of briefing and the next month the public hearing. But I just want you to know that you have been heard and we are going to do everything um, to roll towards a new model where we bring you things early on. Um, so I just wanted to, to mention that uh, and not let anyone walk away thinking that they totally ignored us. <laughs> so, but once projects are kind of towards the end of their lifespan, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to, to try and jam in an extra um, session with you all. I, I uh, Two things. One, I just did want to, speaking of feeling ignored, I want to make sure we note that Commissioner Kenshin has arrived, he arrived soon after we started, just for the record, for the minutes. Uh, I'm also just curious from staff, the what what is the path on the signed ordinance at this point? Uh, because I know there are still comments coming in. What's the, just what are the steps at this point for that moving forward? So the steps, once we feel we have addressed some concerns of elected officials and the community, we'll bring it back to the Planning Commission so we're the first stop? You're the first stop. Okay. And the bulk of it will remain the same. There's just a few things like um, signs in the right of way, as you might imagine, which are still creating some controversy. Right. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? I would just say I know this may not fit the staff capacity. I, for one, this doesn't have to be a quarterly thing where this is kind of a scheduled quarterly update. I think it's it's helpful for us to get these updates and some more advanced updates as we get further down the path of this process. And so for me, it's much more about just looking at meeting agendas. And if we have smaller agendas like this evening, let's make sure that we're taking advantage of that time. If we have meeting agendas like last month, please do not <laughs> add anything to the agenda. So that, that's just my take. I know the staff resources might not allow that, but I would encourage you to not Think of it as having to be quarterly, given how the, the workflow comes to us. I think that was the ish part of. Yeah. Okay. 
Great. All right. More One more thing. So one th another thing that I was going to ask, um, add if I may, is that um, Grace and I have been talking about, and this is not just for this commission, but for our other boards and commissions, whenever you have a light agenda, bringing some more, um, although I know we have our, our kind of biannual trainings with you all, bringing some more almost educational, you know, have a stormwater expert come and really talk about what happens at the site plan stage. Um, have someone from our development review group come and talk about the nitty gritty of site plan review and approval for those that may not be as familiar with it. So I think things that may give you all uh, a better comfort level with some of the zonings that are less specific, let's say, um, as to what our development regulations in totality address or don't address. So we will look um, in coordination with the chair to try and whenever we see you have a light agenda, slide some of those things in, if that's all right. I think we would welcome that. Great. Commissioner Bryan? Uh, sir, I would really enjoy hearing the stormwater thing because we've had so much rain recently that this business of a 100-year storm may have to be revisited and <laughs> regulations may have to be updated and so forth. You're just well, getting older you. faster, Troy. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and given that we just endured a two-hour delay of the public schools That's opening right. this morning, I would very much like to hear an update. Commissioner Miller. This is something I mentioned a while back, and uh, it makes me nervous every time I do any kind of training. Our emails with citizens and with each other and what have you are public records. Uh, and right now, like Hillary Clinton, I'm running mine through my one email address. Um, I would feel a lot more comfortable if I had an email address that was over here, and if somebody wanted to see what somebody had said to me or what I had said back, that it would be right there and it would be segregated from all the other emails I get and it won't rely on me searching up and down. I, I've been on the commission for four years now. I've only had two requests for emails, somebody who was on one side of a case asking for the email chain from, that I had with somebody on the other side. And I have done my best and everybody seemed to be satisfied with it. But it, it as an old city government, I mean county government, never mind, too, too late. As an old state government guy, um, I would like to have all of that happen somewhere else. I do not know how big an ask this is, uh, whether I can get a CI Durham uh, email address uh, that I can access, that everybody else can see too. Um, it would also help to remind me that everything I am doing is there for somebody to see, and it could carry that thing at the bottom that I do not want at the bottom of every email I send that says that my emails are, are emails to me and emails from me on planning commission business are public and people available. They belong to the people and the people can see them. We can, we can inquire. Thank you. I would appreciate it. Commissioner Bryan. Um, based on some of my experience getting emails from the city of Durham on topics that are totally unrelated to planning, uh, I would worry a little bit that if we had an email address for planning commissioners, you might wind up getting more emails than you ever counted on, and some of them won't be related to planning. I still get an update every time the tech people do something. Mm -hmm. I used to get stuff about signing up for my medical benefits and stuff like that. So. I'm getting those. So I think we have to, it could really be a problem for staff to set up something that's just for planning but is isolated from everything else. <laughs> I don't know. And that, uh, and if that's a, in fact the case, then <laughs> we'll just carry on. But uh, I do feel like Hillary Clinton, every time I get into an email exchange, I don't look like Hillary Clinton, but I feel a little bit like her. Commissioner Johnson. Yeah, uh, I, that, that's a good point, uh, Commissioner Miller, because I'm sitting here like playing, you know, hypotheticals. It's like <coughs> our communications with citizens or anyone reaching out regarding cases is considered public information, but it could be the case where some personal relationship about someone reaches out, my best friend, and it's like, what do you think about, I hear a case is going on, just personally, what do you think about it? Is that deemed like a public record 
if I'm using my private, my, my personal Gmail account and I'm having a, con a con and so that's why when you're saying that I think it is, there should be a way where there's a, a portal, a, a, a portal, an email address or something that's dedicated to Right. Residents or whoever reaching out to us through that vehicle so that there won't be any gray area for us knowing when and what is and what is not public, considered public information that has to be shared when whoever asks for it, whenever. Let me clarify one thing. If, gigantic if, someone had a city email, that does not mean that if you were to email something on your personal email about a case or a topic related to planning commission, that is also still a public record. So having a separate email does not then make your private email off limits. No, no, what it does is it just, for, it, if you, it's it makes segregation easy Much if easier. you are disciplined about how you use both. Right. But the discipline requirement doesn't go away. Sarah's yeah. right. And if this doesn't work out, I can set up another email account and just have a, one for everything and one for for this only that gets published on the on the directory part of the website so my emails start coming just to that and I won't use it for anything else and that's the point I was on in the, right so they have one go to well we we'll look forward to a staff update if that's a possibility and if not I think we've identified our backup solution so anything else for this evening could I just ask one quick question about that would uh, this email, uh, the emails that we receive from the public is, is something directly to us and as long as it's just to us as individuals rather than as a board, uh, that's okay. Uh, it's when we get into uh, like some things that I have mistakenly done, uh, included everybody on the board. Uh, if there is something that needs to be tracked in the city system or county system or whatever, uh, when it comes from staff, it is whatever we say is public record. Uh, does that make sense? I, I, I'm just for keeping things simple. So Commissioner Gibbs, I think you're actually confusing two different, different but related things. One is open meetings law. And open meetings right. law says that you cannot conduct business, which includes uh, discussing either verbally in person or digitally online through forums or in emails back and forth. You cannot discuss the business of the body outside right. of a published and advertised meeting. That's among ourselves. That's open meetings. Right. Correct. So that's open meetings. Right. The other is public records, which says basically any, any record where you and your official duty as a planning commissioner are discussing business, if someone, if I'm a citizen and I email you, oh, oh please do something about this horrible case that's about to you know, come before you, please don't vote for it. That is absolutely a public record, and someone could ask to retrieve that email from you. So it's two separate things. Well, that now, yes, certainly the emails that originate from our accounts are automatically, you know, we archive them and we keep them. But there may come a time when um, we get an open uh, records request for some of you all's emails, and we have to reach out to you and say, please compile them all and give them to us. That's separate and a different issue than open meetings law. Okay. That's tough. Great, thank you for the clarification. Great, seeing no other questions or comments, this meeting is officially adjourned. Have a good night, everyone. You too.